friends, subscribers, YouTube users, welcome. This one is Bioindividual Mindfulness, the right starting point for non-dogmatists. This is a special release of one of the lectures, uh, which is available to my subscribers on Substack. And um, I'm going to probably release one of these videos to the public over the coming months, every now and then. Uh, this is the first release, which is kind of an overview, I guess, of what we're talking about. Um, particularly some people who listen to us on the uh, mindfulness episodes. I think I, I referenced this in those episodes. Anyway, this should give you a bit of a taste on where we're coming from, which is a little bit different to the traditional approaches because Kevin and myself are not really traditionalists. I have a little bit of an interest in it, but I'm not really. So if this sounds like it's of interest to you, there is a Substack link below with much, much more material like this. We don't really publish or I don't really publish all that much on YouTube. I publish more on my Substack. That's almost entirely free. Um, so yeah, or feel free to subscribe to that. There is also a paid option where I include all sorts of bioenergetic exercises, breathing exercises, all sorts of technologies you can use. Um, however, don't feel obliged. Uh, only if you like that kind of material, feel free. Um, and of course, if you do become a pay subscriber, you get uh, a heavily discounted access to my full course, which is going to be like 100 to 110 uh, very special sessions. And that's all I'm going to say about it on here. So uh, without further ado, Bio Individual Mindfulness, lecture number four. Thank you. Good evening, whatever it is. This is the final part of the series, but it, it is actually a very important part of the series because this is where we're going to go through why uh, this is so different from maybe other forms of mindfulness, um, in, at least in its orientation. And orientation does matter a lot. It's one of those things that all of us need to get a handle on before we pursue a path like this. We need to understand why we're doing something. We need to understand what we're going to get out of doing something. And we need to understand, in general, the reason why we're doing something. And in this way, um, bioindividual mindfulness differs from mindfulness in religious systems. Very importantly, it, it differs because our aims are different. And within that, there may be the feeling that some have that there are paradoxes. And that's something we're going to look at um, in this presentation. So let us get on with this. So I have termed this and Kevin, my co-host with um, kind of throwing around ideas in last night's podcast. These practices have always had mystical meanings. Now, I always thought this was quite absurd because at the end of the day, particularly with mindfulness, the experience, the even the ultimate experience is one that is is not, it doesn't have meaning. Meaning is something that is generated by the part of yourself that you're trying to rationalize or overcome or contextualize properly. So we've, we've termed this meditation without meaning. So in the bio-individual vertex, and more on that a bit later, we're coming from a different place, moving beyond the duality of the spiritual and the material. And this matters because in all spiritual systems or almost all of them that I can possibly think of, maybe except for a few notable exceptions. There is a duality between uh, the spiritual and the material, the mundane and the super, um, super, uh, super mundane, um, heaven and earth, good and evil. Now, 
when we make progress in our meditation, we realize that in fact, these dualities are nonsense. They're nonsense for the reasons that we've already gone into. So we're also Westerners. This is important. A lot of the systems in which these practices are in are systems of the East, usually of the East. And the ones that have been brought into the West still retain some degree of mystical uh, baggage. That e even the ones where someone has taken the practice and making their own thing up, which is kind of what I'm doing, even in those situations, there's still usually some sort of mystical assumption or mystical hang-up, um, usually some sort of duality. Uh, good and bad, or you know, whatever, whatever the system. All the systems I've seen have something like this. So this bio-individual system and this um, epistemological starting point that we're going through now is an attempt to do away with that as much as possible. The way that we do away with that as much as possible is that we ensure the method is first of all free of all dogma free as much as possible uh, from language and assumption and metaphor and labels, um, but also free of objectification. It's not an objectified thing in the sense that there are outcomes that we want to have. There are outcomes that are beneficial for us. And any labels or anything else that we apply to the method are simply for the aim of what we want to get out of the practice. That's it. So let's go through some goals. What are, what are the goals of mindfulness from a bio-individual perspective? The first goal is self-mastery. We've gone through why self-mastery would be achievable using mindfulness, mastering reactivity. Physiological discipline, making the crooked straight. You may recall the quote from the Buddha about how the work is designed to make the crooked straight, which is the hard bit, which is the sitting practice. And the other practices that people like, uh, <clears throat> say, Kevin do with his posture work, for example. We won't go into it here because that's going to be a topic for something later. But in short, making the crooked straight is extremely important. And it's an extremely important feature of any of this work because it has a direct impact on how you process the world around you and how your nervous system functions. There's no getting out of that. And this is one of the biggest shortcomings of schools that just do a direct pointing. And then they say, don't worry, there's nothing else to do, uh, nothing else to do now. No, there is a lot to do um, regarding the physiology. There's a lot. When you sit, you are balancing all these things, all these latent capacities or, or capacities that have been uh, or not being utilized properly. Acquisition of personal power. How can you use meditation for power? Well, we're kind of discussing that, aren't we? The way that you use meditation for power is by freeing yourself up from reactivity, freeing yourself up from the contraction of the self, which is something we can talk about later. And the practical outcome of this, this is not a metaphor, is freeing up uh, I guess what you'd call biophysical energy. You free up a wellspring of energy that was tied up in being reactive and silly, which means that you have become more powerful. That is power. The ability to act in accordance with uh, your will is power. Self-definition and the pursuit of self-definition. This is a critical part. And it ties in with all the other things. These, these are all kind of different ways of saying the same thing. Um, Self-definition is an end goal or it's what you want to have in mind during the whole process. Self-definition is when you define yourself and what's important for you. We are not defined by ourselves, usually. 
usually we're defined by forces completely outside of our control. Forces that we don't understand, beliefs that we don't understand, uh, ways of being that we were inculcated with when we were children. And we still live out to this day, even if we live them out successfully. They don't need even to be uh, negative. You could you could uh, be living in such a way that uh, maybe some of your parents gave you good habits. We tend to focus on the negative, but it's not necessarily the case. But that is not really being self-defined, not in the way that we mean it. It may, it may not be a bad thing. Maybe <clears throat> your work will just show you that, oh, I didn't really have anything to do with it. It was just a behavior that I inherited. Um, but self-definition is crucial to this work. It's in many ways what we're setting out to do. Meditation helps with this because it helps us overcome reactivity and it frees up space in which we are able to make decisions that suit us, that give us more power and essentially then give us uh, the ability to self-define. Having it all with no moralistic demarcation. So this is going to be a controversial one. This is probably going to make a lot of people angry. So we've been talking about self-definition and power, the acquisition of personal power, self-mastery, um, all these different things that would appear on the, out, on the surface to be uh, acknowledgements of the self, the very thing that I'm saying the whole time that we're trying to get rid of. And this appears to be a paradox. Well, I'm telling you, it only appears to be a paradox. It's not a real paradox. Experientially and empirically, there is no, there, there are no paradoxes. That's just something that our minds make up. It's what, it's what happens when the left brain can't figure, figure something out. When its labels and categories get confused. It's, it's limitations. You can have uh, all the things I discussed yesterday uh, in terms of the meditation levels. You could have like a very high degree of enlightenment and insight. You could have no self. You could have all these different things. But you can also have material. You can also have um, a job that uh, forces that needs you to act in the real world. You could have a wife and children. You don't have to give up a wife, a wife and child. You, you don't have to be celibate. You don't necessarily have to do those things. Maybe you need to if you really want to deepen your practice and go the full way. That's up to you. That's your decision to make in your goal to self-define and have self-mastery. Because we do only have a limited time on earth. Um, and you can't get amazing at everything, likely. So you're going to have to choose some things over the others, and those things are naturally going to require that you give something away. But anyway, back to the point is that you can kind of have it all. Seems like you can't, but you can. Or at least you can try to have it all. Living authentically, willfully, not being lived. This ties into uh, a famous statement of Dr. Hyatt, how he said, humans are not living, they're being lived. And this is quite literally true. We are extremely reactive. Um, as I was saying before, the self-definition thing, most of what's going on beneath the bonnet is not within our conscious purview. We didn't decide on. We were just inculcated with this, whether it's genetic or uh, the way that our parents told us to do things when we were young, the inferences we made from uh, what our parents were doing, uh, and all these feedback mechanisms uh, that further cement these ways of being through our lives. And as a result, even though we think that we're doing something that is willful in, in the sense that we, uh, here's myself that is controlling all these things, in reality, um, we're not willful uh, really at all. Um, from a greater perspective, we're extremely reactive. 
So living willfully, living with will, as Nietzsche would say, and his uh, fans online would say, therefore necessarily means that we cannot be lived. And therefore we need a method and a means not to be lived or to free up ourselves from being reactive. And the way, one of the ways you can do this is through mindfulness, as I've been saying, and you now know the reasons and the way that that works. This, of course, also ties into living authentically, because when we're willful, it gives us the ability to simply be authentic. What's an example of being authentic? Well, when I think about it, being authentic could be something like um, if if someone uh, wants you to come to a social engagement and perhaps you kind of had something else planned, uh, maybe like recording a, a video and you actually don't want to go either. So you could make up an excuse. You could say that my, my wife is sick or you know my, um, my dog's got AIDS, what, whatever it is. <clears throat> and um, that's what we tend to do. We tend to not want to be authentic. But if you're authentic, you would say, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. And so you can apply this principle to everything in your life. Being authentic means acting without pretense and particularly pretense. It's outside of your conscious purview. The chance of a new seed culture, man as a bridge. Now we all know Nietzsche's famous expression about man as a bridge, man as a transition. I agree with him. I think that's why mankind has developed these practices. Um, and so far, I've not really spoken about anything greater. So I've not, I've tried to make it about us. Like, this is what you'll get out of it. This is what we are going to do. But in a, in a general sense, I think that the bio-individual philosophy is also aimed at a chance uh, of a new culture, laying the seeds for something new. And it could well be that it comes to nothing. And the human being is simply just too flawed. It just can't have this happen. But nonetheless, I think these technologies do exist um, with the potential for a new culture to develop, uh, for man to have some degree of mastery over himself at some time in the future and perhaps to act as a bridge for the forms to come. Okay, moving on. So meditation without meaning. The bio-individual vertex, seeing ourselves for what we are, this is important. So this is something that as you meditate will become clearer to you. But in order to make progress in this work, there are certain assumptions that we make about ourselves and um, uh, us as, a, as an animal that are mistaken. So in order to gain personal power, there needs to be a knowledge and perhaps acceptance of the real nature of the human condition. And in many ways, much of this will seem offensive to you. Maybe some, some of you will become very angry at some of these statements. Um, that's okay. And as you go through with the method more, hopefully these things will actually start to become just really quite obvious to you. So I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to do the work and then you will see what I'm talking about. Because in many ways, even though there is an intellectual element um, to what I'm describing here, it is true that most of these um, most of these contentions, or most of these statements, or or uh, yeah, statements about the reality of, of the human being. Sorry, just turn my light on. Uh, <clears throat> are uh, experiential. They're experientially derived truths. So you see them, you see them to be the case. 
but there are also things in here that are backed by science. Um, so the first thing is we are mostly out of control and we have no understanding of ourselves. I'm not going to go into that. I've already spoken about that ad nauseum. As Chris Hyatt said, there are some important primary factors that shape us and operate under the hood, dictating how our autopilot works. Sorry for the spelling mistakes here. I'm in a bit of a rush. This is what he thought, and I think this is a really excellent rule of thumb. So the first thing is design flaws within the species. That is important, and uh, anyone that follows my Twitter account knows that I love the book, The Accidental Mind. I think his name is David Linden or Richard Linden, where he suggests that the human brain, although it is this amazing thing, is also really just a hodgepodge evolutionary adaption, and in many ways it operates quite badly. Um, and I think when you do a little bit of this work, you'll recognize that that's absolutely the case. And I accept that perspective, at least on a practical level, a scientific and materialist level, uh, without any hangups. It's absolutely, absolutely comports with the reality that I've seen. Number two is poor wiring and reactive chemistry. So we are all about reaction. And since you've been meditating, you'll start to notice this. And you, when you go deeper with it, it will become more and more apparent to you how reactive you are. And that does tie in with the actual neurophysiological wiring of the brain. And you may recall the pictures of all the uh, uh, different colors and fibers that I've been using for the introduction picture for each uh, different video. So that gives you some idea of uh, the complexity and really the mishmash kind of <laughs> haphazard way that it's all put together. And you, you can see that in the picture. So with these two things together, uh, it leads to poor outcomes and it leads to um, our inability to live in accordance with some sort of well thought out reason and rule, which is what individuals and, and us as a species just can't do. We just can't manage it. We end up in all sorts of just terrible scenarios. You know, and we, we attach otherworldly explanations to things. We may say, oh, it's because of this political theory was wrong and, you know, all these different things. It's because of traditional morality, man. We've got no traditional morality anymore. Um, the case here that the bio-individual philosophy makes is that no, it's because of the animal itself. It's because of shortcomings in the apparatus that these quote-unquote problems keep occurring. Protracted um, infancy and childhood. So, so this is an interesting one. Um, in, in human beings as opposed to other species, most other species. Human beings have an extremely long childhood and there are many, many years before a child uh, reaches maturation. And even then, at certain points of maturation, uh, human beings, of course, are not fully, fully done. And of course, you know, I forget the exact numbers, maybe this has changed over the years, but, um, we don't fully develop until I, I believe we're 30 and there's some semblance of being fully developed at age 25. Not that these are necessarily bad things, but in particular, the, one of the problems is the childhood. Now the brains of children are interesting because children don't have the same brains as adults. And in many ways they are effectively not human in the way that we think that they're, they're human but they're like a completely different animal in a way. So they, they don't have the ability that we have as we get older to discriminate, um, but to rationally discriminate, to make rational decisions about what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So basically, um, because of this long childhood, all sorts of irrational, silly, uh, dumb, dumb ways of doing things can be 
inculcated into the child uh, and mimicked by the child. And he has no uh, metric or measuring stick to determine whether or not the thing is ridiculous or not. And this can happen on a large scale. I mean, there's entire civilizations where they do this and they just have really quite bizarre practices. One could see in a um, state of nature how this could be this could be fine because you're just mimicking hunting or you're mimicking making a bow, whatever it is. You could see how this technology is quite novel. But when it comes to bio-individuals as opposed to normal fags, this very often can be the source of much of what ails us. A lot of what ails us comes from this period of protracted childhood. Obviously, the child, children are very narcissistic and very emotional. Um, there is a, a helplessness uh, coupled with a very, very intense fantasy, uh, fantasy life. And as a result, you get all sorts of strange feedback loops and amalgamations within the brain, all sorts of strange governing behaviors, uh, compulsions, uh, covered up narcissism. And basically it's from this substrate largely that our reactivity comes from. So one of the activities I did when I was studying with one of Dr. Hyatt's students is you would write an autobiography, like a right from day dot, from your earliest memory, uh, from the perspective of the third person. And um, this is an interesting exercise because you, you see def different patterns and you can sort of start to see or unravel where certain behaviors came from. Uh, according to certain situations that happen when you're a child and you can see what your relationship with those things is now. So th without a doubt, uh, a lot of what is going on under the bonnet is formed during this period and you're not conscious of it. Or we, we are not conscious of it until it's deliberately brought into the, into the mind. It's deliberately understood or pointed out. And what uh, Dr. Hyatt's student did for me was he ripped me to pieces. So to someone else who's been through the process, it's actually extremely obvious what's going on, particularly when you know their character now. So you read the story, you know what they're like now, and you're like, well, you know, you're continuing this or you're continuing that, and that's why this sort of stuff is happening. It, you know, it's a, hard, <clears throat> a hardcore form of psychoanalysis, and it works because, you know, that's true. That's what happens because of our long protracted childhood. Then of course, when we're adolescents, we have a long period of a very intense sex drive, um, which really just kind of covers up everything else. Everything else takes a back, back seat. And in a way, the, the strong sexual impulse is really quite a, not debilit, it's a powerful force. And, um, what, what happens as a result is for a, from a bio-individual perspective. So again, not from the proliferation of the species into endless numbers. That's not what we're talking about. From the perspective of a bio-individual, which is someone that doesn't want to be reactive or end up in patterns of simple reproduction and consumption of things, which is all that most humans do. They don't really have anything else to them. They're reactive bundles that engage in reproduction and consumption and then continue on to the next generation and they don't really contribute anything. As a bio-individual, it's not that so much we reject that, but we want to be in, more so in control of it. We want to be conscious of it. We want to be conscious of all these things that are going on. And one of the things that gets in our way uh, is this protracted childhood and all the fantasies that came along with it, all the wrongful assumptions we made, all the wrongful inferences we made. Many of the things that ail us didn't even happen. We just imagined them. There were, there were all sorts of things when I was going through it where, you know, I look at it now and I'm like, that was just a wrongful conclusion that a child, a narcissistic child made. And you can go an entire life 
drinking and being anxious or being unhappy simply based on an illusory problem generated from a wrongful assumption made during a protracted childhood. So whenever people tell you that psychoanalysis is nonsense and not useful, I'm here to tell you those people are wrong. But it's it's meant to be quite not mean, but it's meant to be you're getting pulled apart. You're getting pulled apart. So it's not a nice process necessarily. Uh, inadequate control number four, inadequate control and feedback mechanisms. This ties into reactivity. So the feedback mechanism is out of our control. So we don't know what's going on. And um, the control of it is um, uh, inadequate control of ourselves uh, as well. We're highly reactive and it's very difficult to the point we have to sit in meditation for 10 hours a day to start to develop control. If, if we are a being with free will, like everyone asserts, then this should be pretty easy. I would have thought it'd be pretty easy. Magical thinking, often tying in with protracted childhood. Again, this is the fantasy life that I was talking about, but you can extend this to things like religion. Uh, you can extend this to uh, mysticism. You can, uh, what's the, the new one that, that people do? Um, po you know, positive visualization or what is it? The message, how you just visualize being a billionaire and then it brings it into reality. That is nonsense. That is childish <laughs> nonsense. And this is what we did when we were kids. This is what we did. It was magical thinking. We we're like, I'll just think it to be the case. You know, I'll think something into reality. Um, and this, this feature, of course, is tied in with being immature, being a kid. It, you know, unfortunately, if you want something, you have to go out and try and do it. <laughs> it's just one of those things. There's no magical way to think it into being. And of course, when a child thinks magically um, or has fantasies and they don't work out and its narcissism is hurt, well, you, you can just imagine how that translates to some adults and the way they behave. Learning by imitation. This is an interesting one, again, tying into the protracted childhood. So again, uh, in a primordial environment, perfect. So you, you're out with dad uh, if you're a boy or you're out with mum if you're a girl and you're learning how to hunt or you're learning how to ride a horse or you're learning how to, you know, make cheese or, you know, whatever it is. And you imitate. That's how kids learn. They imitate their parents, which is why sending them to uh, daycare when they're kids. Like, are you seriously, do you seriously do that to your children? It's unbelievable. So this, this, this is a thing and it's fine. It's not necessarily bad. None of this stuff is bad necessarily. But um, yeah, what if what if you're what if you're multi generational fuck ups? What if uh, you know who you're imitating is a complete imbecile, an imbecile from an imbecilic culture? I mean, you're imitating everyone all the time, and if that stuff is limiting and stupid, then you're in all sorts of trouble because the reactivity that you're going to have as an adult is going to just be just self-defeating to the nth degree. The illusion of language and intelligence is free will. This is uh, an interesting one. So anyone that's familiar with my Substack knows that I often write against the idea of free will being a, an intelligent or coherent concept. And through this course and through your meditation, you've now noticed why that's the case. Experientially, we can say that we are complex feedback mechanisms in an environment. But there's no space for, for free will as we understand it in that. Um, we're more part of a complex super organism that is offering feedback to an environment that's, uh, and, and our purpose is, is to survive. It's not to have free will as an individual. Um, so this is a great illusion, particularly of Western civilization. Like uh, since St. Augustine, um, 
really introduced it. Which I don't think the ancients suffered from this as much. Um, but we certainly do now because they needed a free will to make God and Jesus work, of course, right? That's kind of where it comes from. But that's an illusion. It's not true. And because it's an illusion, it makes the bio-individual work very difficult because you have to break down this in yourself, the fact that everything is self-directed when it's not, or at least not in the way that you think. The illusion of language is free will. I speak, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am. Uh, yeah, language makes you think all sorts of things, including that you have free will. But in your meditation, what have you noticed? When you have, a, when a thought comes up, when a thought comes up, you grab on onto it, then you have this discursive dialogue. But you also know that when you don't have that, what's there? What's there at that point? But the fact that you're grabbing on onto a, a word or a structure or a phrase that really isn't born of you, and even if you do then use it and, and, and you know, quote unquote, use your own facilities to, to run with the thought, that in itself, the language, um, how you learn to think, uh, you know, all the other things, that, you know, that's not you. You didn't make that. That's not free will. Free will is a funny, a funny concept. I mean, it is actually really incoherent. Um, and it's a real problem. Uh, it's a problem probably for our civilization that we think that way because, it, because it's actually not what's happening. That's not what's happening. So it may be a comforting illusion, but it's not what's happening. But for a bio-individual, we accept that we don't have free will, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to, um, <clears throat> how would you say, we're trying to create space for a greater range of reactions and choices that we choose. And I, I think that most of us would be in agreement that that's about as close as to free will as a human being is going to get. Number nine, it's an ability to fool itself with language and words. Huge one, huge topic. Not going to go into it here. Most people in general mistake words and concepts for reality. They think their objectification of sense data is objectively true. Um, and as you deepen your meditation, you will become aware of the fact that that is complete tosh. Um, we could go a lot of places with this, but I, I have a podcast interview with a guy called Rolf Sattler, who's into uh, Alfred Korzybski and wrote a book about this. And if you're really interested in just how deep the rabbit hole goes with language and linguistics and how much of a load of how we get it mistaken, then I suggest you go and listen to that interview and buy his book. <clears throat> in essence, language and conceptualization offers us the strongest way to delude ourselves. And the bio-individual acknowledges this. And the bio-individual wants to undo the illusion or, or the, the show that language puts on for us. And we want to use it as a tool only. So we want to get out of that dogma days that language induces. That's all I'm going to say. Otherwise, I'll go on for months. So the bio-individual triangle, triangle acknowledges these truths. The truth that there are material and physical causes for our condition that require no overarching mystical dogmas. You'll see what this triangle is in a moment. This is something that Kevin uh, inspired and something I was thinking about a little bit myself, interestingly enough. Um, but... Uh, essentially, what we're getting at here is that material and the material world, what you know, and that gives a slightly wrong thing because I don't think of material in the same way Richard Dawkins does. But nevertheless, um, with this practice and with these other practices, there is no need for a mystical dogma. You can simply create meaning of your own kind and 
you can use these techniques in the ways that we've been describing to amplify uh, that experience, to make it good, to make it enjoyable. And very often mystical and religious systems uh, have taken these practices and some of the states of mind that they induce, and they've attached, uh, for better or worse, sometimes necessarily, all sorts of moral conclusions and overarching moral systems. And we reject that because we're seeing things in a more practical way, at least at most levels of this work, in a more practical way. Which is to say, though, because we can have it all, it doesn't matter. We can also be enlightened, but we just don't reject the material. Lots of, lots of spiritual systems reject the material. That's not what we do. We embrace the material, we venerate the material, and we don't reject anything. Mindfulness has measurable impacts and attenuates these excesses. Therefore, it's no spiritual, it's not spiritual enlightenment only that we seek, rather the mastery of the organism or person that we are. This perspective is free from all the moralistic and dogmatic hang-ups of the religious systems that have some elements of these methods. Therefore, the method itself is refined and simple. I've tried to keep this method simple because that is literally all you need. You don't need anything else, I'm telling you. And this is accessible because it's simple. There's no need to go through all these huge system is voluminous writing all you need to do is follow the method and sit meditation forms part of the bio individual triangle that we'll get to in a moment that are practices that seek to overcome our natural state as much as we can in particular reactivity which is the main thing that holds us back from our potential as individuals and as a species very good Let's see if I can find my uh, little thing here. Sorry about this. Here we go. <clears throat> okay. Moving on. Meditation without meaning. The bio-individual vertexes and triangle. Oh, look at that. So with the lotus sitting position, which is where people sit in meditation with their legs crossed, it's a triangle shape. And although I don't do it, by all accounts, it is a shape that gives you a very, very stable base. And you'll be interested to know that the triangle is the strongest shape there is. That's because each vertex, which is the corner of the triangle, mutually reinforces the other. And it's exceedingly strong if something is balanced on it. Uh, and this is used in engineering all the time. So Kevin and I were talking last night because I had that actual um, Lotus thing in my mind, funnily enough. And um, I forget how it came up, but we were talking about how these practices, including mindfulness, body work and movement, are all tied together. Because they are. They're all elements of the same thing. Because they're just borders that we draw up. Um, and each category simply allows us to focus on one particular element of the totality of the human physiology. So this is something that you're going to be hearing a lot more of uh, coming up. Um, and this is the first contribution, I suppose, the mindfulness element. Um, but you can see in the bottom we have body work, which is, you know, the Reikian work or various other types. <clears throat> Posture work that Kevin does. Uh, various things like that. And then you have movement on the other side, which is the mastery of movement in space, movement activities. It could be kickboxing or weightlifting or, um, you know, those uh, <clears throat> movement guys that do, you know, all the weird movements. Um, so all of these things, we believe, form the basis of self-mastery. Now, there is one that isn't mentioned in there yet. And that is uh, philosophy. What what I'll term at the moment is philo as philosophy. I, I probably prefer the word analysis. 
But anyway, this is incomplete. It's just something I've been looking at. But I do believe that mindfulness is the crown of the triangle. Because mindfulness, unlike these other things, offers us an opportunity to properly contextualize the entirety of consciousness and conscious experience. It holds a very important place for a bio-individual practitioner. Meditation without meaning. So without dogma, without mysticism, without confusing mystical titles and weird stuff. The paradoxes. So no doubt a lot of people are thinking about paradoxes. It's like, well, if I'm meant to get rid of myself, why am I doing all this stuff that is seemingly fortifying myself? If I want the spiritual experience, why should I embrace material experience? If I have the material experience, why should I have the spiritual mix experience? And then simple things like aversion and uh, desire, uh, or this is good, this is bad. And of course, the granddaddy of them all, uh, good and evil. Well, as we know now as meditation practitioners, first of all, there isn't dualism. It's not real. And you'll start to understand that more and more as time goes on. It's just how unreal it is. It is a construction, it's a convenient construction. And sometimes a very inconvenient construction. An inconvenient construction upon which all sorts of delusional behaviors are built. This is what someone like Nietzsche was, was really getting at uh, in, in many ways, like in beyond good and evil. Meditation for bio-individual practitioners, sticking to the method, puts us in touch with the right-brained consciousness or the totality of oceanic understanding, however, however you want to put it, with awareness in which all these dualistic false dual notions collapse. And in terms of our work, uh, what does that mean? It means that to embrace one to the detriment of the other, if it's not self-directed and in context or in light of our purpose, this is ridiculous. And most of all, it's self-limiting. You're limiting yourself. You get one life. You get to taste it all. Uh, why, why would you limit yourself based on a false dual notion? And your meditation is showing you it's false. So it's not a par these things aren't paradoxes. They're not uh, dual uh, contradictions. Uh, life itself is unavoidable. Life is the only arena in which any work, transcendent or otherwise, takes place and can take place even in what spiritual types would consider debased or mundane. I'm sure you're all he you've all heard of Zen in the marketplace. Um, it all ties in with your mindful practice, if you think about it, because if you get to a certain level of, uh, of concentration and acceptance and immersion in your practice, it doesn't matter what noises there are, because you're not going to react to them. Um, by the same token, you could be in a beautiful environment on retreat, and there could be birds outside uh, making noise. But for some reason, that's acceptable. So the birds are okay. The cars are okay. The screaming babies, uh, sorry, the cars are not okay. The screaming baby is not okay. But ultimately, it doesn't matter because all these things uh, uh, are okay and they're all within life. And there's no good or bad because you know that because you're meditating. All these things are permissible. So in this way, we can use day-to-day -day, uh, activity that seems mundane or profane or materialistic or any of the other silly labels that we apply to things. And we can use it to, first of all, um, uh, pursue personal power and self-mastery. But second of all, to pursue enlightenment. 
Because again, these are just labels that I'm using for this process that goes on. And the process doesn't have duality, doesn't have any of these things that we ascribe to it, any of these barriers. Those are self imposed barriers. And thus, when meditating, those barriers should actually collapse. There is no ultimate destination, no self to aggrandize. Then what's the point of anything at all? Man is a brilliant magician. There's a very good quote from Christopher Hyatt on this, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but he says that man is a, is a brilliant liar or magician. So he can make up purpose and he can make up a destination. He can lie about it to himself. He can think that it's real. Um, and this, of course, is a wonderful trick. It's a good trick for survival, first of all. It's a good, good trick for living life. But it's not real. But then again, it doesn't matter. So you can, you can have the realization that there's no point to anything at all. You can have the realization that there is no ultimate destination, that this thing is not real, that it's a construction of the um, discriminating temporal facility that we're trying to overcome. So in our sitting practice, these things just fall away because they're, again, they're labels we ascribe to split things up in a world that's not split up. And when you develop this understanding that these things aren't objectively true or objectively real, that they're tools, that's extremely powerful in terms of self-definition, because then all of a sudden you can create whatever destination you want to. You can make yourself into a work of art as you see fit. And mindfulness will help you get to that place. Some people say that power is the only thing that matters. Others say it's spiritual attainment and the rejection of power. Both are wrong. Both things can be attained. There is a duality that is false. So again, this ties into the false nature of many of the dualities that we accept or take for granted. Now, there may be a reason that someone wants to become a Buddhist monk because it, it will deepen the practice a lot. And if they determine that's what they want to do, that's fine. I, you know, I couldn't care less. But no one can convince me that the robes and the ritual and the image is any different to a guy in a suit going into an office on an ultimate level. No one can convince me of that. Yet, in the minds of most people, this exists as a duality. But when we're mindful, what do we know? We know that that is just experience itself unfolding. As it will. And that as bio-individual practitioners, with mindfulness, with sitting, and with any of these other practices, we can, we could go and do be a monk, or we could go and uh, be a businessman. And in a certain sense, this can be used as spiritual material. But it can also be used as material to gain power. And trust me, with monks, you know, there's still hierarchy. There's still things going on. You know, you see all these guys on the internet, not you, Pano Basa, I like you, but a lot of guys and they they were in a monastery once and then like they come out and they're like, oh, you've got to love each other and, you know, I'm all enlightened and they get like a million followers. If If they were so selfless, why would they want to do that? It's because these things are false. They're all falsely applied labels that we put onto things because we're acculturated to think uh, this way. These guys were truly not into material and they were truly, you know, spiritual. They wouldn't want any of that. But that's not the structure of the world. End of story.
So as a bio-individual, we acknowledge that. That's important. And therefore, there is no paradox or, or contradiction. The desire for more and more is generally run from a place of fear, imbibed from when we were young. Uh, this is a burden and awakening provides a place of rest. So this is an interesting one. Um, we would think, therefore, uh, relating to the, the other thing, that if you were a businessman and you are pursuing the evil material, that therefore you would not also be entitled to an awakening experience or to uh, pursuing greater consciousness because those things just can't exist together. <clears throat> and in a certain sense, this could be true. So it could be true because when you see these really driven businessmen that are going hard, and we are talking about uh, beliefs that we have from a young age before we can rationalize, the desire for more and more does generally run from a place of fear of not having enough. So there are beliefs operating underneath these people that really compulsively compels them to almost destroy their lives. I've seen people utterly destroy their lives because they couldn't get a handle on this kind of thing. So if you have a good material situation, um, a good job, there is actually a benefit in having an awakening type experience or a place to rest or a meditation practice because it undoes a lot of these underlying beliefs as we've been talking of, uh, about. And so that, that contradiction or that paradox between the two polarities also collapses. And I've already spoken about why it's possible to just be a businessman and also be awakened. So literally no contradiction, no? And of course, uh, waking up is liberating. And we can choose to drop the games that we used to think important. This ties into what I was saying before about a desire for more and more, being in those games and enjoying the things that we do think are, are important. So, so again, you can pursue the material world. You can still have liberation, some degree of liberation, liberation that you derive from sitting practice. And what that is going to allow you to do is to realize that, well, <clears throat> everything being equal, which are kind of weirdly is i think i'm going to choose this game in this game and that's what i'm going to do and in a way that's kind of what bio individuals seek to do and of course i'm making uh, this out like it's all easy i'm not saying the path is not an easy one but what i really wanted to get across with this presentation is that the supposed paradoxes that you're thinking of that, oh, well, it's not spiritual, then how can it be physical? Um, you know, how can you pursue power and still have awakening? I hope that this uh, part of the presentation has helped you understand how it's possible, because it is possible. I'm living proof. I'm telling you it's possible. I, I also don't expect you to believe me, but you can go out and try this and you'll see what I mean. Ah, the big naughty no self. So the power in seeing through the illusion of the concrete self. Now, I'm not going to go too autistic. I have writing on this if you're interested. But this is another species of what we've just been talking about. And it's perhaps one of the biggest species because it is directly related to mindful practice because at some point chances are you're going to have an experience of seeing through the illusory nature of what we term as a self in the west because that's what it is it's an illusion it's not concrete and it has no continuity <clears throat> so why would this be important if we don't see it from a spiritual point of view why would it matter? Why couldn't we just go through the world? Well, if you're not a bio individual, you could do that. But if you're someone that does care about self mastery and self directed, non reactive behavior, then 
seeing through the illusion of the concrete self is kind of important. So Dr. Hyatt, um, for anyone who listens to our podcast, you know who that is, who approached this matter from a scientific point of view, pointed out that the self is a cause of a large amount of suffering. And even though people cherish this illusion, it is in fact a concrete, con- contracted, let's say, state of energy in which flexibility is greatly reduced. The paradox of working with yourself with meditation and dropping yourself at the same time, well, there's literally no contradiction. So this is a difficult one to <clears throat> to understand. Um, I, I would just say that from a practical standpoint, the self is energetic contraction and it's patterns and because the patterns are the same and the contractions are the same it makes us feel as if there is a stable continuity to this thing that we call the self but it is a a contraction of sorts And it is derived from habitual behavior to a large degree. It's derived from uh, the way others react to it, to us. And um, all these feedback mechanisms tie into this thing that we, we call the self. So in dropping it, you're not dropping something that is there in a concrete sense. It's more the case that through mindfulness, through the method, eventually you'll simply just drop something that you thought was concrete, but it's not concrete. You're simply recognizing what is already the case. This is one thing that people get wrong. They think that there's something there and big bad Buddhism and big bad meditation is going to come along and blow it up. It's not there. It's not there. And with mindfulness, you you can look for it. And if you look for it, when you, you tell me, can you see anything? I, I've never been able to find it. And when, when you, practically speaking, when you temper this contraction or you see through it and then the contraction itself starts to unfold or unravel, this frees up vast amounts of energy that you can use for different things. Because the self is also a feature of reactivity. The way that we react over and over again also lends uh, the sense of continuity to what we call a self. And of course, our use of language and concepts are heavily involved in casting the mirage. That's kind of a good metaphor for it. So it's like in the desert, you see a mirage and it looks real. And of course, you're very thirsty. And the closer you close, the closer and closer you get to the mirage, you realize there's nothing there. That's what, it, what, is, what it's like. So I often encounter violent reactions from philosophers on Twitter and elsewhere. This is true. Never directly. No one ever wants to directly confront me. But I know that that's what they're saying because they just happen to say it after I release an article. I have to say they have a rather cowardly self because the acculturation of the self is so strong from a young age. We cherish our separateness, our perceived separateness because it's not real separateness. The edifice of which we have built ourselves upon. This creates huge amounts of anxiety and fear as a natural biochemical response to the strong conditioning. So a lot of the self is obviously, we're talking about the protracted childhood. You know, this is a, the self is conditioned. We are conditioned in such a way to have a very strong sense of self. Particularly in the West where we are extremely egotistical and I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not saying that other places are worse. Or better. I don't think they are better, actually. I think the real power is if you could have a Westerner 
see through the illusion of self and then use it as they see fit. That's power. And that's what the bio-individual seeks to do. Because the consequences of the self, because it is a contraction, it is conditioning, it is reaction, the consequences are debilitating. They're debilitating for most people. They take uh, the, uh, the reactions take up energy. They get us into all sorts of silly situations, and we we think we're directing all of this, but we've got nothing to do with it. Um, so this is why what what I what I called powering down the concrete self. So you're not you'll never completely get rid of it because it, it is a tool. It's a feature of evolution. It's an adaption but you will power it down immensely. The illusion of selfdom is not a power. This illusion is the cause of huge amounts of suffering and anguish. In unwinding this structure, the energy is liberated and the suffering hugely reduced and seen in its right place. Exactly what I said before. So remember the picture and the differentiation. Why do you think uh, you are any different? So I, I don't know if you remember, but uh, we looked at a picture in the first um, uh, lecture, which was the theory of mindfulness lecture. And there was a picture uh, that I showed you on each successive slide of this uh, painting of a lady. And at first we had no idea what it was. And then it's only when we saw the whole thing from a certain point of view that we're like, well, there you go. So, so the self is kind of like the other way around. So the self, when you engage in mindfulness, just remember this, is you're seeing the painting to start with, and the more mindful you are, the further down you go, down on a very granular level, and you recognize that in fact there's nothing there. Or what you thought was there is not what, you, what is there. So this great vision, this great power, is it, it doesn't end you. <laughs> because you're not there anyway it's a liberating it's a good thing so the experience doesn't need wasteful contraction to be an experience experience doesn't need you it doesn't need a self experience is just experience happening and this is really an ultimate realization of meditation that there is just experience that's true non-dual realization if you function in the world in this way that's really about as far as you can go the great vision doesn't end you experience doesn't need wasteful con contractions uh, to be experienced um, sitting in mindfulness helps you penetrate this illusion and it is probably not the only way but the 95% best way. Meditation, the psychophysical impact. So it, we've spoken on a larger level about kind of what's going on and why we do meditation as a bio-individual uh, practitioner and what what is different between this approach and other approaches. Because this approach also requires other work which a spiritual approach doesn't so much because we're also, we, we also want to uh, function in the world. That's one of the major differences. And therefore mindfulness has a whole other element in which it helps us function in the world. And this whole other element is high level, like what we've just been discussing about the self and all that sort of stuff. But it's also um, not mundane, but there are systems, physiological change that sitting induces that also benefit you. So first of all, you, you remember what the Buddha said about making the crooked straight as the first step in, in the great work. And that's true. And he literally means that. It, again, it's not a metaphor. He's saying you're crooked. And by sitting straight in sitting meditation, you're making yourself straight. And that has the psychological impact of making making a lot of these things go away 
making or changing the nature of the reactivity. If you sit up straight, you know, that is the perfect posturing to notice and to master reactivity. So of course, Kevin does posture regulation. I'm working through his course in the moment. I'm learning a lot and I recommend you go and check that out. I think he's got links on his Twitter. Uh, and what this does is this manipulation of the body has health and character, health benefits, first of all, for obvious reasons, but also it changes character, which is a big thing of the bio-individual method uh, is character change because we see our character, the reactive character that we are as being extremely limited and physiological manipulation changes this. So making the crooked, the tense, and the uncoordinated functional. Breath regulation, health, and character change. So breath regulation is another huge part. And we spoke about cultivating Hara in uh, the method section, uh, video two. But what uh, sitting will do, it will make the uh, the breath work part of your practice the breath slash body work part of your practice uh, that will feed into this and this will feed into that and meditation you'll notice uh, as i said you don't force deep breath in meditation you simply watch the breath happen and what what do you notice when you do it if you're sitting up straight properly so that your uh, abdominal muscles are freed up by by the integrity of your posture and spine holding up your body is that after a while at least in most situations the breath will deepen immensely that's the first thing that will happen and it will slow down and if you do the work or my breath work you can even uh, have some more phenomenal impacts and of course, why you want to breathe slowly is, uh, well, there's, again, there's a whole lot of reasons. I'm not going to go into it here, but that has beneficial impacts on heart rate variability and also the ability of the body to facilitate what's called venous return, which is basically the body pushing blood around, uh, sorry, the breath reflex pushing blood around the body. So th this is very important, very important. Um, and it's important, actually, again, there are mutually reinforcing things. Uh, it's mutually reinforcing because doing the breath work is going to help your meditation and doing the meditation is going to help you understand the breath work. Because literally no barriers. It's all the same body, all the same systems all the same self-mastery. Constructive living, confronting personal problems and barriers whilst giving no fucks. So is one thing, uh, so, so you may be interested to know that uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy, they've started to use mindfulness, not as the method, but as the adjunct. So as a way of coping and managing with reactions. Imagine that. So if we have a situation we don't want to face, if we have a boss that's busting our balls, but we need the money, so we don't want to chimp out, or if we want to chimp out because we don't need the money, I want to go and do something else. This is what you could term constructive living. And I took this from a book, which I recommend you read. It's by a guy called David K. Reynolds. And the book is called Constructive Living. And he goes through all the challenging things in life and how uh, you really need to put yourself aside and just go through the process. Um, it's, it's a very nice message that he has. Of course, there's more to it. But mindfulness is key. It's key to be able, uh, being able to do that because... It literally puts you in a state when you sit of ignoring reactions. 
and focusing. Character change, we've already gone through that. So when you sit, your character is going to change over time for the better. Mastery of momentary reactivity, understanding of personal reactive processes. There we go. Opening ourselves to simply being able to, I should have checked the fucking spelling before I release this, but I'm not going to re-record this. So no way, not going to happen. Opening ourselves to simply being able to enjoy being itself, being ourselves more often, more deeply, to engage with life itself more deeply, to embrace life. This is a much overlooked part, but in many ways, we want to make our life good. We want to enjoy it as much as possible. We don't want to be a victim of it. We want to be as self-directed and willful as possible. And th this is a, usually, usually kind of a, a generally different view than religions take. Religions kind of make everything out to be evil and then you've got to go somewhere good. But we want to focus as much as we can on making the material place good. To increase our power, to enjoy life, to be able to live life in a light and uh, vital way. Including being able to concentrate enough so you can get the spelling of the fucking presentation right. You know, the thing is though, I have this keyboard and the keys don't always hit properly. That's my excuse. So, um, this is an interesting quote and it does tie into something that I want to talk about before we finish up because we're close to finishing up. And that is um, the work of the neuroscientist V.S. Ramachandran. And if anyone's familiar with neuroscience, he's a very important figure. Suggests that the right brain acts like a counterbalance or regulator to the constant storytelling of the left brain interpreter and it steps in any time the stories become too outlandish. So what we're doing is we're taking charge of this process and we're tempering the left brain. And again, this is not literally neuro neurophysiologically true, but in a way it's true, in a way it's a kind of metaphor, but that doesn't matter. It, it works for us. So the ego, the self, the, you know, the bit that's always talking and thinks it's in control when it's not. It is uh, very much prone to outlandish interpretations and stories. Anyone that's listened to our Ian McGilchrist episodes knows about that. Uh, I would go so far to say the left brain is, you know, very often a liar. It's very often a liar. So I want you to look at this diagram that I've got here for a second. I just want you to tell me if uh, about the shape in the middle, whether or not they're the same size. And just be honest, just look at it. So what you may notice is the one in the middle of the four big dots looks uh, smaller than the one outside with the uh, small dots and the, the big center. But of course, they're not, they're the same size. Now, the reason we instantly have that pull is because the left brain, and this is backed up by science, this experiment, the left brain is trying to interpret and trying to use different reference points to figure out the answer to what's going on. Interestingly, in the experiment that they conducted, the right brain was not fooled by this. The right brain knew instantly, whereas the left brain just couldn't figure it out. So again, this should give you a sense that as an animal, we're not willful and conscious. We have all these things that are going on, all these capacities, all these bits that are being put together. And this is a, an example of that. This is a real example of the inclinations of left brain consciousness, the inability of left brain consciousness, and the ability for right brain consciousness to not be fooled 
by something. And if you extrapolate this from this situation to our entire lives, then you can see why something like mindfulness, which is the radical embrace of right brain consciousness, is very important to temper the excesses of the left brain self ego centered consciousness, language label centered consciousness. <clears throat> so this is the last one. Thank you for being with me. So we'll just finish up on this. So with the left brain, with, if you want to look at it through this model, and that's why I brought up this model, because this model is kind of a good model to look at it through. Periods of silence are the antidote to this to this left brain centeredness. You need to be silent. Follow the method. Just follow the method. Don't worry about outcomes or levels. Just follow the method. Because this is what's happening when you follow the method. The quote is, silence is the language of God. All else is poor translation. That's a Rumi quote. So he was a mystic. A mystic hangs around in right brain consciousness. If a mystic is telling you this, then you should listen. He's telling you that silence is the language of God, of awareness, and that everything else we make up, our words, our poems, our pictures, our theories, our toaster manuals, they're all just a poor translation, a left brain approximation. And in mindfulness, you, <clears throat> you'll see You'll literally see why this is the case. Uh, the left brain is noisy and dominant. And it's important to remember we are neither substantial subjects who take the world as object, nor free actors who intervene in an otherwise law-governed natural world. Instead, we are persons, hyper-social organisms embedded in the world in open causal interaction, complex causal continua, who play complex social roles. This is the proper view. This is Jay Garfield, a quote from him. Um, and that's really what we are. And through mindfulness, we can realize this, and it is the lifting of a burden. And silence, the silence of mindfulness and contemplation and focus and samadhi. They are the ways in which we can open ourselves to, to the reality of this. In the same way that the left brain is categorical, the right brain takes a more global approach to what it perceives, rather than dividing things into categories and making judgments that separate the world, the right brain gives attention to the whole scene and processes the world as a continuum. Again, meditation. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, break down the categorical brain because it's out of control in our society. And it's the thing that is responsible for the reactivity, if you want to look at it that way. The right brain in that picture before is the thing that figures out that it's being, it's being uh, hoodwinked. Um, and it has a continuum, uh, or, or it can see the whole scene. And uh, that's important. It's important to have these things in balance. And the bio-individual philosophy is about balance. And uh, physical work or exercises that will bring balance. So how can one become more conscious of the right brain system? Well, in a sense, we're already quite conscious of it. So that's true. But the bias of seeing the world mostly through the lens of the interpreter only makes it seem like you're not, of course. When I say you, I don't mean your ego because the ego genuinely cannot experience the right brain consciousness, even if it wants to. As it, the left brain is can only construct 
And this is a scientist. This is Chris Niebauer who wrote this. Well, he wrote a book on it. So think about that. And think about how we were talking about levels and theories before. So he's literally saying that they have scientific evidence that says that it doesn't matter what you try and do, the left brain cannot get to these places that you want to go. But it also tells us something about the rather flimsy nature of what we consider to be ourself. So powering down the interpreter and the self allows us to temper reactivity and to become fully immersed in the tasks we select. We no longer become lost in interpretation. This is a great power. So many people will say this is religious. This is mystical. But maybe that's true. But, but it's also a massive power. This is an act of power. This is an act of self-transcendence. This is an act of self-mastery. And this means that we react or we act in the world in ways with more choice and more flexibility than we ever thought possible before. And that's powerful. That's powerful in the real world. That's why we want to do it as a bio-individual. The right brain is the doing it center of the brain. And this, I want to finish on this. One way to get more in touch with this, with the right brain, is to cut the left brain out of activities by doing them for no reason. So not for money, not to improve oneself, but simply for the sake of doing them. Stick to the method. Stick to the method. Stick to the method. I keep saying, stick to the method right to the very fucking end. This is why you don't need any other form of meditation, guys. You don't need it. You just need bio-individual meditation. The left brain ego thinks in terms of cause and effect, and in order for an action to be worth taking, it must have a positive outcome. But this can complicate the actual doing of the tasks. Doing it for its own purpose seems to almost always be connected with right brain activities, from poetry, to art, to music, to living, to the method, to the method. So by this point, I think you're picking up what I'm putting down. This is the power of mindfulness. This is what you're doing. I hate using the word hacking, but in a way you're hacking into all of this. You're recontextualizing your consciousness. You're becoming less reactive. You're becoming more powerful. You're becoming more enlightened. You're becoming happier. You're becoming more relaxed. It just is an endless list of benefits. Endless. And of course, there can be tough times. There can be tough times. Sometimes when you're going through something that you hold particularly dear, you can have a bit of anxiety. You can have some other things happen. Some people even feel like they go crazy. But again, stick to the method. Just stick to the method. So I'd like to thank you, first of all, for being a paid subscriber, which is why you get to see this. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'd like to thank you for your practice. And all going well, I hope that we can form a community and learn from one another and take this work to the furthest possible degree as bio-individual practitioners. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to get in contact with me. And I wish you all the best in your practice and your life.